Talking Gamecock baseball on this Monday, Mark Kingston's team back into the D1 top 20, number 18, as they take on PC tomorrow, then uh, head on to Bama over the weekend. We'll talk about those things coming up in just a bit, but let's focus on what happened this past weekend at Founders Park as South Carolina swept number three Vanderbilt. Vandy, by the way, dips a little bit to number seven, so still an excellent top ten team. Uh, Coach, congratulations, and I know it was a little more difficult for you because you had to cram those games into two days, so uh, on top of not being able to play Friday, then sweeping a doubleheader, what, what is it like in terms of the message to the guys they know who their comp- their competition was this weekend. Yeah, you know, the the weather put a little bit of a damper on the plans of getting that thing started on Friday night, but we have a saying around here, just tell us when, just tell us where, we'll be ready to go compete. So, you know, that it all has to start with that. And then I think the, the challenge of, of a series being compressed into almost 24 hours like it was, was number one on your pitching, you know, because most guys will not be able to pitch uh, in such a short period of time, although we were able to use Ganey twice on the first day because they only threw six pitches in game one. Um, and so it stretches your, your pitching a little bit and puts a little more pressure on them. Uh, and then secondly, your catcher. Uh, for Cole Messina to play the way he did for 27 innings in such a short period of time and still swing the bat the way he did, uh, really, really impressed with that. So, uh, again, very happy with the, the weekend as a whole, uh, but but our pitching really responded to the challenge, and Cole Messina really responded to that challenge as well. I'm assuming Cole, as we speak, is still in some type of massaging hyperbaric chamber to completely recover? Yeah, we, we got a discount on the old Michael Jackson one, so uh, that's the one that's in our training room as we speak. Nice, nice. I'm glad you, you knew where I was trying to take you there, so thank you for that. Um, let, let's let's talk about the, the adjustments that you've made offensively, and you talked about this with us last week after the win to close out the Ole Miss series, and clearly it's carrying over in terms of how many runs you scored in the midweek and then 26 runs against an excellent Vanderbilt team this weekend. Uh, you, you, you adjusted a few things in the lineup. That's that's the easy part for us to see in terms of a box score. Take us more, if you would, though, Coach, through the consistent conversations that you've got to have about why guys are moving, how they receive it, and clearly the results are beginning to speak for themselves. Well, you know, I think communication is the key. You've got to talk to guys individually if you're going to be moving them in a lineup. And you're going to have to talk to them if you're moving them in or out of a lineup. You're going to have to talk to them if you have decided to platoon at a certain position. You've got to communicate. Um, so it starts with that so they kind of know what to expect before you put out the lineup each day. Um, you have to get their feedback. You know, if a guy likes hitting in a certain spot in the order, you need to know that. If he doesn't care where he moves in the lineup, you need to know that as well. Uh, so I think the communication from player to coach is very, very important. Um, we encourage it. We initiate it. And I like to know uh, if I think I have an idea on something that can spark the lineup, I want to make sure that the guys will be on board with it, uh, that will be a part of that uh, shift. So, again, I think we've got to talk about those things with our guys all the time. Uh, as coaches, we talk all the time about things we need to do to help our players. Um, what do we need to do more of? What do we need to do less of? What do we need to talk about? What do we need to not uh, belabor? Uh, so it's always it's always – a work in progress, especially as we talk about it all the time, the, the, the age of the transfer portal. You may not figure out your team quite as quickly as you have in the past because there's so many moving pieces. There's so many new pieces to the puzzle. And so it's just a constant evaluation of where you are, what you can improve, what needs to stabilize, and then just try to make educated decisions as you go. Mark, I'll go ahead and take this question to the mound. And one of the more notable I guess the performances of all the entire weekend was was Tyler Pitzer on Sunday, nine strikeouts, one walk and six and a third, had an incredible game, unhittable for a lot of those innings. And uh, the conference noticed it because he's the SEC freshman of the week. What did you learn about about Tyler's ability on the mound and the flexibility he can maybe give you on the back end of your rotation? Well, you know, the, the conversation came down to uh, – the, the game three starter, and, and really the two guys that you can consider are Matthew Becker, uh, who's been outstanding for us, and then Tyler Pitzer, who's also been outstanding for us. And so after the game two uh, victory, we went back into the locker room and we talked about our different options, and um, we landed on Pitzer only because we had had so much success the previous week on Sunday at Ole Miss with Matthew being the first guy in. 
uh, out of the bullpen to, to really stabilize the game and potentially finish a game. And, you know, Matthew seems to be very comfortable where he is right now. It doesn't mean he won't be a starter at some point because he's pitching in a manner that, that earns him that consideration. Um, but what we decided to do was go with the righty uh, like we did last week. Last week it was Roman. This week we went with Pitzer um, for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, we like how it looked last week, and it, it was successful, and it really started our kind of a, a really nice springboard for us. And we knew if Pitzer went out there and only threw an inning or two, then we could hand the ball to Becker, and he might give us six or seven after that. Or if Pitzer came out and did what he did, then whenever we brought him out, whether it was the fifth, sixth, or seventh, then Matthew Becker would have a chance to finish the game because he's been so good for us. So we thought that made the most sense uh, for yesterday's contest and turned out to be really good because Pitcher took that opportunity and ran with it. And, you know, SEC Pitcher of the Week, I believe. So uh, it just gives us another option to look at. And, and again, you know, what Matt Williams is doing a really nice job with our pitchers, and we've got a lot of guys that we can consider in different places. Eli Jones also had a big start for you in game one. Mark uh, was perfect for a bit there. Eskew struggled. His numbers aren't terrible. Three innings, uh, just the one earned run, but he had a walk and a, a hit by pitch. Ty Good, I thought, was a, was was really nice behind him. Is is there any, I don't want to say issue there, but are you uh, with Becker, with Pitzer, and you've got some rotation flexibility now, are those questions that are still out there maybe a bit unanswered or – you know, will we'll Dylan just, you know, chalk it up to a day where he maybe didn't have everything you were looking for? Well, we're going to continue to uh, evaluate everything as we go. Um, but one thing I do know is that uh, we basically have, if, if you're looking at Pitzer, FQ, and Jones as your weekend starters, those guys are all sinker ballers with good velocity, but sinker ballers. And what you hope is that they can get a lot of quick outs, uh, a lot of ground balls, and then you hand the ball off to your bullpen, and it's a lot of strikeout guys. And Good is a strikeout guy, and Beach is a strikeout guy, and Becker is a strikeout guy, and Ganey's a strikeout guy, and, and on and on. And so ideally, that's a really nice way to set up the pitching staff because you want strikeout guys for the last three to four innings of a ball game because that's when it takes some bad luck out of the equation for you. So if you're striking out over a guy in an inning, that's only two outs that, that a team has to work with in terms of a, a, a bloop being able to fall in against you or a ground ball having eyes getting through. So, you know, ideally you have your sinker ball guys starting game, getting either the fifth or sixth, and then you hand it over to your strikeout guys where you can minimize bad luck against you. So, um, that's kind of a way we like to do it, but everything is always under consideration as we go because if we think there's a way to make things better, we'll always look at that as well. A couple more minutes here with Gamecock baseball coach Mark Kingston. How big was the 6-4-3 double play game two on Saturday, not just in terms of the moment, but maybe in terms of sort of propelling the team for the rest of the weekend? It, it flipped the whole game, you know, no question about it. It was a huge play. It was a 3-1 game at the time. Um, that was getting ready to make it a 4-1 game and with still more potential for damage uh, as, we, as we spoke. And Tippett made an incredibly athletic range play going up the middle, flipped the ball to, to Parker, and he completed the double play. And then the next inning we scored multiple runs and took the game over. So for me, that was by far the, the most key moment in that ball game. And, uh, again, it's, it's great to have a shortstop. Tip is struggling some with the bat, but there's no mistaking the high-level defense he is playing um, out at shortstop for us right now, both in terms of consistency but also range. You know, that type of a range play is not made by many people. So not only did he have the range and athleticism to get there, but he made the catch. He turned the, he turned the, the, the ball over to Parker, and we turned that double play. And there's no doubt it, it changed the entire momentum of that game. Another big weekend from Ethan Petrie, too. Five for eight, six RBI, five walks, and two home runs. I, I don't know if you can get much better uh, than that against a pitching staff like Vanderbilt, but what kind of gear is he hitting right now? Well, he's he's becoming Ethan Petrie. You know, again, he's for a guy that hasn't quite hit on all cylinders yet, you know, this year, he still is hitting well over 300 with close to double digit homers, and we're not even at the halfway point. So, um, it's just we all have such a high expectations and standard for Ethan. And, you know, he's really starting to hit his groove again, I think, uh, over the last, I would say, five, six games. Um, and, again, when him and Cole Messina uh, play, like, play like they can and like they usually do, 
it just makes us a really good baseball team. It just does. It's just the way it works. When your best players play their best, uh, that's when you have a chance to beat anybody. And this weekend you saw Messina and Petri at their best, and we had a dominant performance all weekend. Last thing for you, starter tomorrow night against PC? Yeah, we'll go with Copper again right. and, and then hand it over to the bullpen probably in that, you know, hopefully in that five, six uh, inning range. 6.30 tomorrow, so a little bit of a, an adjusted start time. And then the Gamecocks travel to Tuscaloosa this weekend to take on the Tide. Safe travels, sir. Appreciate you. Congrats on the weekend. We'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. You bet. That is Gamecock head baseball coach Mark Kingston. A few more thoughts on what his club is doing as the postgame show continues.